Hi, and welcome to Debunk File. My name is Sepp, and today we are going to be talking about the Antwerp Diamond Heist. One of the most famous staples in pop culture is the heist. Whether it's in a movie or a video game, the idea of a heist that is somehow done against all odds has always been very intriguing among many audiences, ourselves included. Unfortunately though, these pieces of media often take inspiration from real life. We are by no means condoning or supporting criminal activity like this, but in the real world, there have been multiple successful heists throughout history that are incredibly interesting that will leave you scratching your head wondering how they pull that off. Of these infamous heists, there is one that stands above the rest, at least to us, and it is the Antwerp Diamond Heist. Antwerp is the largest city in Belgium and home to the Antwerp Diamond Center. As much as 85% of all rough diamonds in the world pass through this district. In 2003, the Diamond District would bear witness to possibly the most insane heist in history. During the weekend of February 15th to 16th, a heist was carried out at this Diamond Center. This crime resulted in countless diamonds and other forms of jewelry being stolen, resulting in an estimated 100 million being taken during this time. Because of that absolutely outrageous sum of money being taken during this heist, it has been since dubbed the heist of the century, and it definitely isn't hard to see why. With all this being said though, naturally, many details about this heist would leave anybody in complete bewilderment, as it just doesn't even seem possible. Questions that got raised after this event would be, how exactly did these people do this? Who was involved? And perhaps most interesting of all, what happened to the valuables? Yeah, the strangest part about this entire mystery is that with over 100 million worth of valuables being taken, many of which being diamonds, almost nothing was ever recovered. There were some people apprehended for the mystery, who we will get to in a bit, but unfortunately for us, even when these people were interviewed, they gave a scarce amount of information and didn't do much in helping us to crack this case. But today, we are going to attempt to change that. With those three mysteries that we've outlined a moment ago, we're going to delve into each of them and attempt to figure out everything about this case. The first two questions actually work better when discussing them sequentially, as figuring out how this heist was done and who was involved pretty much worked together. With all that out of the way though, let's just get right into this. Figuring out how this was done and who was involved is a question that, like we said, is best if it is grouped together. But first, we're going to talk about how this was done, as it will lead us into the next question. Everything starts with a man named Leonardo Notobertolo. He is a member of the influential Notobertolo Sicilian family. The family dates back to the Middle Ages over a millennia ago, and has included military leaders, royalty, and scientists. Leonardo was arrested for supposedly being the central orchestrator for the entire team that took part in robbing the Diamond District and was put behind bars for 10 years. Throughout his prison time, people have naturally prodded him for answers since, as we stated, it's absolutely miraculous how he and his team was able to break into this place. We haven't stated it yet, but now is likely a good time since we're on the topic. But the Antwerp Diamond Center supposedly features 10 layers of security, which included infrared heat detectors, seismic sensors, and a lock with over a hundred million combinations, just to name a few. Leonardo, however, whenever an interview would spring up, would decline to really say anything, and this lasted for years, which frustrated many who were so incredibly curious over this case. That was until a man named Joshua Davis, who wrote a piece about the case on Wired, was actually able to interview Leonardo. I don't know what it was about this particular guy that made Leonardo open up, but he did, and he actually gave out a ton of information regarding the backstory and even why he claims to have done this in the first place, which we will get to. 
Leonardo had lived relatively close to Antwerp Diamond Center for a while now, and was a thief for a long while already, reportedly committing over a dozen robberies by 2000. He had been robbing people since the age of six, and allegedly led a group of super thieves called the School of Turin. Bartolo's first step in connecting himself with the Diamond Center was by literally becoming a part of it. In 2007, Bartolo rented a small office in the Diamond Center, presenting himself as a gem importer, occasionally buying small stones. Over time, his charm would get him close to these people, even leading him to get invited into offices, workshops, and even vault rooms to inspect the merchandise. What these people didn't know about Bartolo is that he was already stealing right under their noses. Leonardo, when stealing various goods, would sell with only a few select dealers. But one day, one of these dealers came up to him, asking him the golden question. Could the vault in the Antwerp Diamond Center be robbed? Leonardo's answer was, well, no. Despite the offer being incredibly enticing, as this dealer was offering him six figures to carry out the heist, Leonardo had to be honest. Due to him having a great relationship with many people inside this center, Leonardo actually put a tiny digital camera on a pen and sneakily took some pictures for this dealer in order to show him that, yeah, this couldn't be done. It took five whole months for this dealer to come back to Leonardo, and when he did, he was met with something pretty shocking. This supposed dealer, using the photos that Leonardo supplied, had an entire replica of the vault built, and also had an array of others that would help Leonardo in this robbery. There were three people. Leonardo didn't reveal their real names, obviously, and instead opted to using pseudonyms. The descriptions of these people sounded like they were straight out of a movie. The first of these was someone he dubbed the genius. This person was supposedly an expert at disabling alarms and stuff of that sort. After that, there was the monster. He was a tall, muscular man who was a great lock picker, electrician, mechanic, and diver. Finally, we had the king of the keys. This was an older man who was an expert in key forging. The safe they needed to get into had a giant foot-long key that this man would have to recreate perfectly, a task that for many reasons would be extremely difficult. Now that he had a crew, Leonardo accepted the challenge and so he was off to work. With it being the year 2000 at this time, there was an immense amount of prepping as this was obviously no small feat. In September of 2002, after two years of setup, this group was able to hide a tiny camera behind a glaring light which made it invisible to view. This camera captured a guard entering the combination to the lock and showed the key when he put it into the safe. Fast forwarding to just a day before the infamous heist, Leonardo who was still considered very good friends with the people in this building was buzzed down into the vault. He had just one thing on him, a can of woman's perfume. This can of perfume was sprayed which temporarily disabled the heat and motion sensors that they needed to be offline in order to carry out the heist. Now of course, there was security footage available, but because all these guards were so used to Leonardo by this point, they just must have not been paying attention. With all that being said, it was still hard to tell how long the trick would work on the sensors for. This wasn't their only way of cancelling out the sensors, as the monster had something to bypass them. But he needed this perfume to work for long enough for him to do that in the first place. And as we know now, it must have worked. Now, for the night of the heist. It started with the group parking a few streets away from the building. The genius brought them to a private garden adjacent to the Diamond Center. This was one of the very few places that did not have video surveillance. The genius climbed up to the second floor on a small terrace which had a heat sensor. He came prepared though with a homemade polyester shield which blocked this sensor from detecting anything. With the terrace now immobilized, the rest of the group came up, where they then disabled an alarm on one of the balcony windows, and just like that, they were in. While making their way to the vault, they covered each and every security camera in black plastic bags, turned on the lights, and somehow didn't fire off a single alarm. Now that they were at the vault door, the genius had one more thing to do. One of the security measures at this vault door was a magnetic field, which had the purpose of not allowing the vault to open even if it was unlocked. But unfortunately, this security system was installed outside of the vault, making it easy to immobilize for an expert, and the genius was ready for it. He created a homemade slab of aluminum that stuck onto these sensors, and he immobilized them. We stated before that during their years of prep for this fateful day, they had a tiny camera installed that was invisible due to the light it was on. During the many times they watched this combination being entered and the key being used, they were able to memorize the combination and see where the original key was left at, which they used. 
Once inside the vault, the monster took out the remaining forms of security, and the Master of Keys assisted in picking whatever locks were necessary. The room was pitch black, and they pretty much blindly took whatever they could out of all these boxes. They could make faint glimpses of the contents within, which included of course diamonds as well as boatloads of currency, but they did not have enough time to truly examine what they had. They returned to Leonardo's place, and this was when they were finally able to check the contents of what was inside. Leonardo was expecting at least 100 million, but a wave of shock would quickly resonate with the entire crew. The majority of the bags they stole were actually empty. Now, they still stole at least 20 million dollars, but that was far away from the hefty 100 million dollars they were hoping for. Leonardo then came up with an elaborate thought while reflecting on his interactions with the diamond dealer. He started thinking that this dealer was not alone. He believed this man told some of his fellow merchants to clean their inventories before the heist. With that being done, they could now claim that their gems were stolen, collecting insurances while still keeping the diamonds. In short, Leonardo now came to the conclusion that he was simply being used for some grand scam. Shortly afterwards, the whole team would meet with the said diamond dealer where they split up the rewards with each member earning roughly 3 million for the heist. Shortly after this, Leonardo would actually get arrested for the crimes in what is honestly one of the funniest things I've ever seen while looking into a mystery. You see, there was actually one other person that was present during the heist, and his nickname was Speedy. He was a childhood friend of Leonardo's, and despite the other heist members not wanting him to be part of the job, Leonardo brought him in anyways, purely out of loyalty. Speedy's role during the heist was basically as an overseer for the outside of the building and as a timekeeper, where he would alert the members of any possible commotion outside and what time it was so that everybody knew how quickly they had to do their job. Unfortunately though, Speedy folded. He completely collapsed under pressure when he was driving with Leonardo when they had to dispose of their evidence and ended up pulling into a forest where they disposed all of the empty bags from the heist, some other miscellaneous things, and a salami sandwich. Unfortunately, these people picked a forest that was actually owned by someone named August Van Camp. He frequently went through the debris that teenagers would often leave there, but obviously what he saw this time was a little different. As we stated, he saw some empty bags, white envelopes that said Antwerp, some other things, and a salami sandwich. He called the police and they instantly scrambled to the site, recovering a torn piece of paper with Leonardo's name on it a business card with the name Elio Diornio, who was the electronics expert connected to a series of robberies and as such was clearly the genius, and they also collected the heavily emphasized salami sandwich, which hilariously was really important. After collecting the evidence, the detectives executed a search warrant to search inside Leonardo's rented apartment in Antwerp, and there they found a receipt from a salami store. When going to said store, they had the surveillance rewound, and at the point they needed, they saw a tall, ripped guy buying some salami. His name was Ferdinando Finotto, and he was the monster. The police spotted Leonardo's family leaving their home with an array of bags, and when searching these bags, they uncovered some integral evidence. There were SIM cards in here from Leonardo's cell phones that were used exclusively to call three people. Elio Diarnio, the genius, Fernando Finotto, the monster, and finally, Pietro Tavano, who was Speedy. Everybody was arrested except one person. That final person was the King of the Keys. To this day, nobody has a single clue who this man was and where he is today. With the story now being completed, it's important to note that Leonardo most likely did not tell the truth about everything. In fact, it's pretty much proven he lied about some things, which you will see in a little bit. This story did help with one thing though, and that was how they did it. While Leonardo was almost certainly lying about multiple aspects of the story, his explanation as to how they were able to infiltrate this highly secured center completely checks out in every way, as the scene of the crime completely supported everything he said on that front. This took years and years of prepping and was incredibly difficult to do, and they pulled it off. That's why the fact that a salami sandwich helped them all get caught is honestly so hilarious to me. So now that we know exactly how the heist was pulled off, it's time to figure out who exactly was involved. This is where we have to cast severe doubts on multiple portions of the story. We have stated that we know everybody who carried out the heist besides the King of the Keys, but those aren't the people we're talking about. We're more going along the lines of who hired Leonardo in the first place. Leonardo explained that he was hired by a diamond seller who basically scammed the whole system, but this was most definitely not true. 
as the place wasn't even insured. I mean, it's called the heist of the century for a reason. What these people did was supposed to be absolutely impossible. Now there's a huge blatant question most likely circling around all of your heads, and that is, what about the buyer that Leonardo talked to? Because of that theory now being thrown out the window, it isn't hard to believe that the guy Leonardo created in his story didn't even exist. So then who actually hired them? You might say that these people carried out the heist on their own, but the sheer difficulty and even the concept behind it all would never have even been considered if it was just these robbers alone. With the diamonds never showing up again, it's clear that they weren't for the people that pulled off the heist. They were for somebody else. Somebody definitely hired them to do this, but who was it? There are a total of three theories we have come up with, starting with the Chinese Triad. If you didn't know, the Chinese Triad is the biggest organized crime organization in China, and like any giant enterprise, they aren't just confined to China. Dozens of these triads are active in China and Asia, and one of these is the 14K, which is the second largest triad in the world, led by an enigmatic man named Ponytail. The triad claims 20,000 members and is responsible for a wide range of crimes. The 14K also does have an operation in Antwerp, and that's why they immediately caught our attention. I don't see this theory as being too likely though, as it is said that this operation only deals with heroin trade and illegal gambling, not stuff like this. Of course, anything is possible and I'm not going to completely rule the Chinese triad out, but it's pretty unlikely, especially when compared to the following theories. This Chinese triad theory doesn't have any merit, as there is no confirmed connection between any of these robbers and the triad, and as we said, their subgroup located in the area doesn't deal with robbery at all. The next theory deals with the Russian Mafia. Now I want to get the main retractor towards this theory right out, because it's the exact same as our last, and that is, there is no established connection between any of the members of the heist and the Russian Mafia. But unlike the triad theory, this one does have a handful of other things that make it much more probable than our previous speculation. For starters, the Russian Mafia, or Bratva, Russian for Brotherhood, is incredibly powerful, much more so than the previous group we mentioned, and they have operations all over the world. The most notable Bratva group is the Red Mafia, led by the infamous Simon Mogluvik. The organization is based out of Budapest, Hungary, and numbered 250 individuals in 1996, with likely many more joining in subsequent years. Mogluvik is considered the most powerful criminal leader in the world, and it's been stated that Mogluvik is close friends with Russian President Vladimir Putin. Basically, when he demands something is done, it's done. Another crucial thing to note is that the Bratva is allied with a special group of thieves called the Pink Panthers. They specialize in jewel thievery and even have an operation in Belgium, which of course includes Antwerp. Therefore, it definitely wouldn't be out of the realm of possibility that this group, which is known for jewel heisting, had a small crew do all the dirty work for them and give them each a reward. Like we said at the start though, there is no confirmed connection here, so while this is relatively possible, we still can't wholly side with this theory, but don't count it out either. Bratva and specifically Moglovik are kings of disappearing evidence. This final theory is different though. What the past theories lacked was an established connection, but astonishingly, this final theory actually does have a clear connection that makes it more plausible than the previous two theories, and unless we hear something from you guys in the comments, this is definitely the most likely theory. It's another mob group, this time we're talking about the Sicilian Mafia. This mafia has definite connections to Belgium and has been involved in crimes that would make it completely reasonable to assume that they would help pull off a heist like this. But now is for the moment you have all been waiting for, the connection. You see, Leonardo actually has a cousin named Benedito Capizzi, who was a known associate of the Sicilian Mafia and who was actually very powerful. This completely links the two parties together and would make it completely plausible to assume since the Sicilian Mafia knows of Capizzi's cousin and that he is a very skilled robber, they want to use him to pull off something like this. At the time of the heist, the Sicilian mob was led by Bernardo Provisano, who had been on the run from the law since 1963 and more or less controlled all the Sicilian families by 1995, making him the most influential Sicilian criminal alive. On an amusing note, Provisano was born in the town of Corleone, the village made famous in the Godfather films. Provisano was arrested in 2006 and Benedetto Capizzi was nominated to become the new boss of bosses until he and 93 other Cosa Nostra members were arrested via Operation Perseus in 2008, which further shows that yeah, he was extremely well respected in the mob. 
While we can't completely confirm that this is who helped on the heist, it is the only theory out of any of the ones that I have seen that truly has a legitimate shot of being the case. Again, if you guys have any other theories that you come up with, do not hesitate to comment below. Overall, we find the whole Sicilian mob theory to be very likely, but we still cannot confirm it for sure. However, there is one other question that we must attempt to answer, and that of course is, what happened to all the diamonds? Now of course, these stolen diamonds were sold, but the process of selling stolen diamonds is actually excruciatingly difficult for a multitude of reasons. First off, if you have a polished diamond, these are often laser inscribed with a name or a number which would help authorities identify them faster. These laser inscriptions are completely invisible to the naked eye as well, however it is possible to remove these laser inscriptions, which it's highly likely a mafia that especially had this idea planning for so long and also had a history of jewel heists would know of and actively do so. There is however another type of diamond, and that is rough diamonds. These are more common than the polished ones and are harder to trace as they come in so many different shapes, sizes, and even colors. They obviously don't have markings on them that detect the origin of them, and that makes them even harder to trace. Rough diamonds do require government paperwork confirming that these are not used to finance violence, but once again these groups are well aware of that and most definitely can just forge the paperwork. With all that knowledge in mind, these thieves had a couple different options for selling these diamonds without them ever being recovered. The first option is that they can sell them to factories where they will all be cut and polished, which will completely disguise their origin. This however is not what these thieves would likely want to do because cutting these diamonds would likely reduce their values. The more likely scenario was that they engaged in something called diamond round tripping. This process involved diamonds that would be traded between a number of countries multiple times, shrouding their origins in mystery before they're eventually sold for real. As for figuring out what method is more likely, we're of course only going to be able to speculate. While the first method sounds pretty counterintuitive as you are losing money when there is another method, it is easier to pull off. And you have to remember that there was a hundred million worth of valuables. I don't think losing a few million in this scenario would be too bothersome. The other scenario was certainly possible and of course, we will never know for sure, but I'm leaning more towards the first series since, as I mentioned, it was easier to pull off. Overall, it's great that we were actually able to learn how they pulled off this miraculous heist, and as we saw, it took many years of close analyzation and a very talented crew in order to make this possible. With that being said, while a theory on the Sicilian mob being the true masterminds behind this operation seems very likely at the end of the day, it is still unconfirmed though, and likely will be forever, as we definitely aren't going to see anybody speaking out about those specifics anytime soon. As for the diamonds, they were sold back into the market without being caught, but again, we won't be able to figure out how, which really does leave the entirety of this case completely shrouded in mystery. While we definitely figured out some things and do strongly believe in our theories, at the end of the day, we can't truly confirm any of them. The only thing we can do is simply sit in awe at the fact that the world's most successful heist criminals were caught by a salami sandwich. Thank you guys so much for watching. Make sure to follow all of our social medias for updates and exclusive content, all linked in the description. Especially consider becoming a patron as even $1 a month really helps and you guys get some slick rewards. And of course, make sure to like this video, share this with your friends, and subscribe. As always, my name is Seth from Debunk File. Thank you guys so much for watching. Bye.